Nu ska vi nämligen vidare i programmet och eh, vi kommer ju att prata ja, men lite om de frågorna vi har pratat om nu. Mm. Mm. Men vi ska faktiskt lämna Sverige igen och eh, den här gången så ska vi åka till Bryssel och ska lyssna på just en föreläsning från verksamhetschefen på Eurogroup for Animals. Och för dig som inte vet vad det är så är det en paraplyorganisation för djurets organisationer i Europa där djurens rätt också är en del. Och ja, vi kommer få höra om organisationens arbete på EU-nivå bland annat. Ja, och vi vill också påminna dig då att du kan ställa dina frågor på rutan längst ner, Q&A, till Kirsty. Men då byter vi språk. Ja, yeah, så so we say hello and welcome to Reinike Hamleers. Hi Kirsty, Reinike. Hey. hey, good afternoon, dear animal advocates in Sweden. Good to see you all. The studio looks really cozy. Thank you, thank you. Well, um, take it away. We're ready to listen yeah, to you. Yeah, will do. I will now share my uh, screen. Um, oh. So thank you so much for inviting me to this very innovative and exciting summit. I believe you are really front runners as you already planned for this uh, digital event way before we were all forced to go online due to the coronavirus crisis. And it's really great to be joining you today and to talk about how we can make a difference for animals in the European Union and beyond. And I would like to start by uh, briefly introducing uh, myself Uh, my name is Renika Hameliers, I'm the CEO of Yoga for Animals. And on this slide, you see me releasing uh, a recovered owl, which I did during my time working for the Dutch Society for the Protection of Animals. And I've worked in the animal uh, advocacy world since I was 16. And when I moved to Brussels to work for Yoga for Animals, Many people asked me what I was going to do in this bureaucratic jungle with lots of men in gray suits who have never seen an animal from up close. But I hope that after my speech today, you will understand why I never regretted this uh, decision. Um, so before I would like to tell you a bit more about my work, um, I would like to ask you two questions. Um, so please get ready for a live uh, poll. Because I would like to ask you, um, what is more important in driving societal change for animals? And there are four options. So what is more important? Raising awareness through educating consumers and citizens. Uh, that's option one. Option two is rescuing animals. Option Three is obtaining commitment from corporate stakeholders, for example, retailers. And option four is obtaining legislation to protect animals. So please take your time to fill out this poll. Then I move to question two. Um, because the second question is, do you think that the European Union has an important role to play to protect animals? And the options here are very simple, just yes, no, or I don't know. So whilst we are waiting for the results of the poll, uh, let me introduce my organization, Eurogroup uh, for Animals. So we were founded in 1980, um, and today we are the leading pan-European animal advocacy federation convening 70 uh, member organizations, animal protection organizations in 25, a European Union member states, as well as across uh, the world. And you can see here on the slide that we are a very colorful bunch. Uh, we convene more traditional animal welfare organizations, animal rights groups like yourself, uh, grassroots organizations, single issue organizations, and international players. And we are very proud to have Dunes Rat as an active member of our animal, animal protection force for a very, very long time. And our primary goal is to improve the well-being of as many animals as possible by achieving better legislation, standards, uh, enforcement and societal attitudes, whilst we go for our vision, a Europe that cares for animals. So how do we exactly do that? 
Well, we represent our uh, members and the animals' voices, voices in numerous advisory bodies, uh, platforms like the European Union Animal Welfare Platform. And you may think that this is all very boring, but often we are the only ones speaking up for the animals. As these uh, mechanisms are very much dominated by uh, the industry. So it's very important that the animal voices are being heard. Then secondly, we run uh, EU-wide public-facing campaigns because we also need to influence the political uh, agenda. And here you see an example of a recent campaign we launched. It's called Stop Pandemic, Start Here. And of course, it is related to the coronavirus crisis and the trade in wild animals and uh, intensive farming practices. And thirdly, uh, we also function as a central meeting hub of the animal protection movement in the European Union and beyond. We really bring all uh, the animal advocates together to learn from each other, to coordinate, uh, to think of new campaigns. And here you see two familiar faces at our annual general meeting last uh, June. Um, so this was a bit about how we operate. And now I would like to go back uh, to the results uh, of uh, the poll. So uh, let us see if the results are already uh, there. Um, I haven't got a message yet. Um, ba, ba, bum. I hope they will still come through. Well, in waiting for the results of the poll, uh, maybe you are already able to see them, but I uh, haven't uh, seen them uh, yet. Uh, ah, now I see something coming through. Uh, ah, there we go. Um, let me see. So, uh, coming back to the first uh, question, what is more important than driving societal change for animals? So, I think that the majority of you agrees that we should raise awareness through educating consumers and citizens. 62%, uh, 8% said rescuing animals, 3% said obtaining commitments from corporate uh, stakeholders, and 27% said obtaining legislation to protect animals. And then going to the second question, 98% uh, of you believe that it is important um, that the European Union uh, plays a role in protecting animals. And I think that's really great because clearly I would like to talk uh, today about the importance of driving legislative change uh, for animals and the role of the European uh, Union. Um, so I hope to convince you that you are already convinced about the role of the European Union, but I would like to convince you about the importance of driving legislative uh, change. So let me first elaborate on exactly that. Why is legislative change important? Uh, luckily, I'm not the only one um, who believes this is important as a scholar and animal advocate, uh, Kim Stolwood who spoke at your summit uh, some years ago, uh, presented a very interesting theory on this in his book, Growl. And he draws the parallel between the animal advocacy movement and social movements, which we clearly are. And in his book, he claims that usually social movements pass through five stages, from public education to public policy, for example, seeking support from corporate players, um, legislation, so making sure that we anchor our demands in legislation and enforcement. This means that we should make sure that the legislation is also implemented. And in the end, this will lead to public uh, acceptance so that the public will embrace the issue. And as you can see here, uh, we really need to be active at all levels, but our impact will be greater at the legislative and the implement implementation levels, because that means we really enshrine the change we want to see in long lasting legislation. So let me now turn to the importance of driving legislative progress for animals at the European Union uh, level. Um, clearly, even if you're not a big fan of the European Union, um, animals cross borders all the time. As you can see here on this slide, uh, dead or alive, this is an overview of life transport. Uh, but you can also think about the import and export of meat, 
uh, the cross-border collaboration between scientists who do animal experiments, but also the puppy trade. But the whole idea behind the European Union was to create one single market, which should facilitate a level playing field between the countries. So that, this means that in practice, around 80% of the legislation that relates to animals in Sweden comes from the European Union. And before I will turn to the European Union's achievements for animals, let me give you a quick crash course on how the EU uh, legislative machinery works. So firstly, we have the European Commission, who is in charge of initiating new legislation within their mandate. And every member state appoints their own uh, commissioner. So there is a quick quiz here coming up. Uh, who is the Swedish uh, commissioner uh, during this uh, term? Um, very curious to see uh, how knowledgeable you, are, you all are. Uh, there are three options. Uh, we will come back to the results um, in a bit. There's another important European uh, institution, the European Parliament. I hope you all participated in the European Parliament uh, elections, very important. So um, although they are directly elected, uh, the members of the European Parliament can't initiate new legislation, but they can push the Commission to do so, and they have their say on legislative proposals. And then there's the European Council, and this is the body where all the 27 member states come together, so also Sweden, and also the Council cannot propose legislation, but they have a very strong influence on the proposals from uh, the Commission. Um, so over the past decades, the European Union has introduced an awful lot of legislative acts for animals, and it likes to pride itself as a global animal welfare leader. So let me now give you a quick overview of some key achievements. So in 1983, the ban on the killing of young seals and the trade of seals products was introduced. And this was really a very important moment for our movement. And then in 1987, the use of veal crates and inadequate diets for calves were phased out. And this was the first key directive related to the housing conditions of animals. And then in 1999, we saw the laying hand directive uh, set minimum sp space requirements per laying hand and banned uh, battery cages. But of course, we got the awful and rich cage in return, which we are now trying to get rid of. Then in 2001, uh, the ban on close confinement of pregnant sows was introduced. And two years later, we saw the ban on the testing of animals for cosmetic purposes, which also applies to importers to uh, the EU. So all this animal welfare legislation culminated in 2007 in the crucial acknowledgement of animals as sentient beings in the Lisbon Treaty. So a lot of good progress was indeed uh, made, but, and here comes a big but, um, the vast majority of animals kept in the European Union has not been protected by any legislation, as you can see uh, here on the slide. I highlight, highlighted them in yellow uh, for you. Um, but also, there's still a lot to improve for the animals that have been protected by legislation, as most of them uh, are still living in miserable uh, conditions. So this brings me to what the European Union can and should do for animals over the coming uh, years. Um, as you may know, uh, since last year, we have a brand new uh, commission and parliament. And on this slide, you see the new commission uh, and at the bottom, some Swedish champions for animals in the European parliament from left to right, Malin Björk, Frederik Federle and Jutte Guteland. And uh, although the European Union is currently very busy uh, with the pandemic, we have good hopes that they are committed to deliver positive change for animals within the coming five years. And I'm very pleased to see that the majority of you, 61%, uh, got it right and knows who the Swedish commissioner uh, is at the moment for home affairs, Ilva Johansson. Very good, you all. Um, 
So what are the five key priorities for us to achieve in this political term, which will run till 2023? So firstly, as you may know, the European Union is a big transporter and exporter of live animals. Every year, 1.37 billion animals are transported over long distances. And this is one of the most cruel and outdated practice, and this needs to change urgently. So what we want to see is a revision of the transport regulation to significantly shorten transport duration, whilst moving to a trade where only embryos and carcasses and meat will be transported, as long as people still want to eat meat, uh, of course. Um, then secondly, we really need the EU to move away from industrial intensive livestock systems and transition towards higher welfare and sustainable farming practices. And as you will know, this is only possible if we drastically reduce the number of animals kept and invest in alternatives to uh, meat production and a protein uh, transition. Uh, third, uh, I'm not sure if you know, but after arms and drugs, the trade in exotic animals is booming in the EU, which poses huge welfare issues, but also public health issues, as we have recently seen with the coronavirus crisis. So we need the European Union to finally introduce legislation to only allow for trade keeping and sale of animals that are suitable to be kept. And we call this concept a positive list. Fourth, the European Union should put forward a strategy to phase out the use of animals in testing, research and education. And this is not only in the interest of the animals, but also very important for the quality of the science. And then last but not least, we need to protect our animals and producers by making sure that all the imported products to the uh, EU comply with our animal welfare standards. Because you may be surprised that this is currently not the case. Um, and this leads to a lot of imports that do not comply uh, with our standards and consumers can't see the difference. So indeed, there's a lot the European Union can and should do, and we need all your help to make this happen. Um, and you can help us by supporting our campaigns via Durance Rat, uh, but also through Eurogroup social media channels. You can see them here on the slide, but you can already start acting today because we would like to ask you to take action by creating an Instagram story and share your idea to better protect animals with the European uh, Commission. Um, so please tell it straight uh, to them uh, today. Uh, we made an example for you. You can see it here uh, on the slide. Life transport is cruel. Please European uh, Commission stop life transport, but you can pick a topic that is really important to you. And we hope to show uh, the Commission a strong pro-animal voice from Sweden today on this uh, symbolic and important day. So wrapping up, I want to say that if we really want to make a difference for the largest group of animals who suffer the most, we need to do it together and fight for better European Union legislation and enforcement. So we need all your support to create a Europe that cares for animals Thank you so much for listening to me, and I would be very happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, and over back to the studio. Okay, how do you Hi. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Rainike. Uh, You're welcome. We, yeah, we have got some questions here. Yeah, the first one is, uh, is progress in animal rights issues in one EU country something that affects other EU countries? Ah, I like this question because uh, indeed, this is how we work. Uh, um, for example, uh, we work with Durant Rat on uh, making sure that Sweden will introduce a ban on the enriched uh, cage for laying hands. So to get all the chickens out of the cages. And we uh, don't only do that in Sweden, we also do that in a lot of other countries. So once we have five to six uh, European countries who take the lead, 
uh, then we can say to the European Union, see, uh, this is uh, what's happening in, uh, in the European countries. Uh, so now the European Union needs to legislate. So definitely very good question. What's happening at national level will ultimately also count at European Union level. All right. And, and we got uh, another question from our viewers or participants. Uh, is there a big difference between animal welfare among the different EU countries? Ah, yes, absolutely. Uh, but I couldn't say that one country is better than the other. I think all face very different issues. Uh, some people may believe that uh, the countries with more uh, animal welfare uh, legislation uh, have less issues, um, but these issues are often hidden. Uh, when we look, for example, at intensive uh, farming or animal experiments, uh, people don't see uh, uh, what's really happening behind these closed walls. So yes, the level is very different, but I, I wouldn't dare to say one country is better than uh, the other. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for example, my own home country, the Netherlands, has a lot of good animal welfare legislation, but is also a big exporter of animal products and has a lot of uh, intensive farming. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have another question, which is, uh, are there possibilities to put pressure on countries outside of the EU through trade deals? Wow, that's a, <laughs> that's a very, very good, but also a very big question. Let me try to give you a short answer. I think, as I said in my presentation, you know, trade agreements are, are really important because uh, they can help uh, to drive uh, progress in non-European Union countries. So, for example, uh, we are now negotiating uh, a trade uh, agreement with Australia. Uh, so the European Union can then clearly indicate in this trade agreement that Australia needs to uh, improve certain animal welfare standards. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this is often not happening. So uh, this means uh, that products uh, will, you know, cross borders without any restrictions. And this leads uh, to a race to the bottom and can fuel intensive farming um, production. Uh, uh, but not only that, uh, also when we look, for example, at the import of soy, uh, this is a huge issue. Uh, some of the viewers may also know that the European Union is finalizing its agreement with the Mercosur countries. For example, Brazil is part of that. Yeah, this may be very detrimental to animal welfare. So trade is a very important issue to work on as animal protection movement. It's often a bit boring. People think it's boring, but it's super important. All right, and I think we have time for one last question. And it's last summer we saw horrible images of animals being transported uh, across uh, countries outside of the EU under very poor conditions uh, and extreme heat. Is there anything we can do to stop that? Ah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think you know you can all make your voice uh, heard, as I just said, through Instagram and uh, call on the Commission to stop this uh, cruel uh, trade, but also mobilize your own uh, national government. Uh, I think it's very urgent that we end live exports because uh, uh, this is just increasing, which is incredible uh, uh, these days. Um, so, yeah, please call uh, on your national government on the EU uh, to end live exports because we will never get this right in terms of animal protection. But also within the European Union, uh, we need to significantly lower transport du duration. Um, so we hope uh, to see a change of the legislation very soon. All right. And as, as a follow up mm -hmm. question for that, how mm -hmm. come that live transport is increasing? It is increasing because it's still profitable to export live animals to, for example, Middle uh, Eastern countries um, for slaughter purposes. Um, there is still money to be gained there, but it's just a very cruel and it's not an ethical trade. You can't do this right. Uh, and we should really invest in more innovative models, which are already taking place with so the transportation of meat and uh, carcasses and this is really uh, the solution. Uh, um, but yeah, it's still happening uh, because uh, people make money um, out of it. 
uh, for example, Romania is breeding many, many sheep to then export to, to, to yeah, uh, Tunisia and other uh, Middle Eastern countries. So, yeah, uh, we believe that it's high time now to, to ban this trade. Thank you so much, Danike Hamelius uh, from Eurogroup for Animals. Thank you so much for joining us. It was really great. Thank you so much. Thank you.